Hello, and welcome to Statistically Insignificant, a slideshow with voice elements about statistics and game journalism. My name is Tess, my pronouns are she and they, and I'm wandering through this game developers conference with 16 lanyards on, every one of them stating that I am some kind of statistician. Spruiking his new story-driven indie platformer focusing on the condition of man in the face of existential horror, it's Bart. Hi, Bart. Hey, how's it going? I go by he and him, and yes, I did make Disco Elysium. <laughs> <laughs> Does that mean you have Disco Elysium money? We're, we're working it out in the contract negotiations. We're, we'll see. Okay, okay. Look, all I'm saying is that, you know, our funding from dis- from Patreon still doesn't quite cover the uh, hosting costs just yet. You know, that's also a hint to you, the listener. Fresh from a seminar about why you should absolutely not hire white voice actors and ask them to just give it a go for multicultural cities, it's once and future PhD, Artie Wolf. G'day, I use they and he pronouns. Um, I will one day restore my honour within the academe. <laughs> I'm not sure the <laughs> academe has any honour to restore to anyone, I'm perfectly honest. <laughs> I mean accurate. I can dream, <laughs> Harold! It's feudalism for nerds. That's right. I'm sitting up here in my ivory tower and I have a couple of big sticks. <laughs> Today we'll be talking about a breathtakingly stupid creation, the realm of video game character diversity. This one's been floating around for a bit, it was first unleashed on the public at a GDC in 2017 in fact, but recently resurfaced with Activision Blizzard putting out a blog post about their diversity space tool, which appears to have been created by a bunch of people at an acquired mobile game company, King. We're going to talk a bit about the history, then have a look at the tool itself. I'm going to be referring to material that has come from a bunch of articles in this episode. All of them are referenced in the notes. Uh, They have done the actual hard lifting, not me. And I must point to the piece by Maisie O'Dorhey, who has done some historical digging and found a research article which underpinned this effort. Their uh, blog post also talks about measurement of structure as well, which is quite interesting to read. This tool was made in an effort to quantify how diverse a video game is based on playable characters. It is specifically intended to give a measurement which allows you to say that one character is quote-unquote more diverse than another. The rather lofty aim was to use it to help design more diverse characters, because if you can do that, you don't have to hire more diverse staff, so this is a really fantastic saving in wages for game developers, you see. So this was initially brainstormed by unnamed people within the King Game Development Company in 2016 and was worked on by students from the MIT Game Lab as well to develop the basic software, which was then further worked on by people within King apparently working on off hours, quote unquote, simply because they believed in it so much. This is presented as a sign of virtue in the game devs and not indication of the shitty working conditions in the industry, of course. Of course! In 2017, it was demoed at GDC to rate the diversity of Mario characters and show off some of the uh, functionality with regards to some Overwatch as well. At the time, it was wildly criticised for being misguided, inappropriate, and incredibly offensive. This did not deter the developers, and in 2022, it emerged in a blog post on the Activision Blizzard website titled King's Diversity Space Tool, which has now been drastically changed and includes an editor's note covering their asses in the faces of a repeat of all the criticisms they faced the first time. The original is available on the web archive, and oh boy, is it a doozy. An Overwatch character designer came out and said that they just don't use it to actually work with Overwatch characters, despite those being the example in the blog post, and described the tool as creepy. Yeah, accurate. Yep. (laughs) Uh, Others have complained that, once again, the company is doing everything they can to discredit the genuine efforts of dev teams who are hiring diverse staff and having them help to build a diverse character base. The examples today also come from one game, Overwatch. While this has allegedly been used in other games as well, Overwatch are the examples that were available from Activision Blizzard. Because as we noted earlier, they have made this as opaque as possible, potentially because they don't believe in it or to cover their ass or for any number of other reasons. Oh, well, you see, it's proprietary software that they are at some point hoping to license. So they want to make money off it. Yay! Yeah, no. <laughs> One would think that it would be easier to do with a multiplayer like competition game with no real story than it is like a story based game as well, you would think. So But then they're also say... kind of trying to play it both ways because like Overwatch has that comics and video continuity outside of um the game itself. 
where, like, for instance, Tracer is a lesbian, and, like, that's a thing, as opposed to, this is the go-fast character, this is the tank. Like, even Team Fortress 2 does a hell of a lot better with a lot less as far as <laughs> visible diversity. So one of the uh, interesting things about that is that the tool itself doesn't make reference to any way that the character interacts with the game world. And we're going to talk more about that uh, within the context of the um, characters in Overwatch because one of the aspects of that really gets on my goat. So realistically... This doesn't have to be used in a multiplayer game. You can use it to talk about characters within a story-driven setting because it doesn't actually refer to the gameplay at all. I really hate that. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to hate it even more when I point out the problem that I have with it. <laughs> so the material that we actually have is pretty limited. We've got the uh, research article from the MIT Game Lab. We have the original blog article. Through the archive. Yep. Love the web archive. Yeah. So we have a couple of images. So we have the banner image from the blog post, uh, two screenshots of the software. Because I initially thought it was just a graph and not a software. Nah, unfortunately. <laughs> they have built all stuff to go behind this as architecture. And we have uh, the 2017 GDC presentation, which I've taken a, a, a screen cap from that we're going to look at in a second. This is not a lot to go of. So some of what I say will be speculative because I've never been able to really have a look at the like the software behind this and its own structure. I'll try to flag what is speculative. Uh, I'll also try to flag what is interpretation because some of the graphs are really quite hard to deal with. And one of the ones that I haven't put in here that comes from one of these screenshots is precisely because no context is given for the numbers that are in it. So it's not very <laughs> useful. Yeah, like what race are you? <laughs> Seven. Yeah, right? <laughs> So let's get into it. The idea of a diversity space comes from mathematical terminology, where a space is a mathematical object which has a bunch of things in it, and usually some added structure about how they relate to each other. We talk about a space having some number of dimensions, which lines up with its most common usage that comes out of things like geometry. So if we're moving around in 3D space, we have three different dimensions to play with, which are independent of each other. In the case of this tool, the dimensions are different factors which contribute to uh, a person's demographic or diversity. We'll get to a list of those in a second. But you can think of things like gender, race or ethnicity, and sexuality as examples. But, um... As a statistician, those aren't very amenable to the sort of measurement that is used here most of the time when they attempt to use numbers to represent like distance and represent different factors along those axes. It's just the tool is trying to use numbers in a way that numbers don't work, unfortunately, because numbers are apparently more real than the actual experience of people. Oh, 100%. Yeah, so we have these axes, and on top of that, we have a number structure where a character has on each axis a score between 0 and 10. That score corresponds to how much a character deviates as a measurement of that deviation from some proposed norm. So if you're 0 on the axis, that means you're the presumed default for that particular factor. If you're a 10, you're as far as possible from that default. So already we have a couple of problems, right? <laughs> yeah. So first of all, why these axes? In particular, why not other axes? Why not, if you, if you want to do something that's not qual qualitative but quantitative, why not do quantitative measures? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Secondly, what is the norm? We're going to look at that in a second. And third, and uh, this is something that as a statistician I'm particularly interested in, how the fuck do you measure distance? <laughs> Obviously, we need to call in Hercules because <laughs> can go the distance. <laughs> this last one is a particular problem because in maths, we have very, very good ideas about what it means to have distance. They're consistent, they're valid, they're usable. They carry over to statistics where we use them to validate the use of numbers to represent stuff. None of that has been done here. It sucks. Let's have a look at just how much it sucks. <laughs> As a bisexual, I often make the joke that I'm half gay, but I'm glad someone's actually putting that into a uh, computer. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> I mean, like, even with the Kinsey scale, you've at least got X as a factor, where it's like, listen, we don't know either. Yeah. <laughs> 
So this is a slide from the 2017 GDC conference. Sorry for the bad quality, it's a screenshot from YouTube. We can see here what axes there are. So there's culture, ethnicity, age, ability, sexual orientation, body type, and gender identity. We can't really answer why these are chosen. I mean, we can hypothesize. So stuff like uh, ethnicity and gender identity are and sexual orientation are pretty common ideas of what identity looks like. And this is, real, in some respects, a representation of identity. This is the bad kind of identity politics. I'm sorry, it does exist. <laughs> yeah, I do want to flag in this expression of the norm, which is their statement about what their kind of zero on all of these scales is. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's really quite interesting here. So they have culture is Western. What does that mean? Uh, ethnicity is Caucasian, and I'm pretty sure that they does don't- Does it mean, does it mean that they listen to both kinds of music, country <laughs> and western? <laughs> oh my god. Unfortunately, it doesn't actually mean people from the Caucasus. It means white people, but they have to use a euphemism because white would be too political. Also, it, it is named after one particular racist's favourite skull. Yes. Hell yeah. Age, neither young nor old, which doesn't mean middle-aged, it means 30-ish. Yeah. Ability, non-disabled. Sexual orientation, heterosexual. Body type, stereotypical. For what? What? Are they <laughs> drawn by Bruce Tim? <laughs> I know, right? I do want to flag this kind of stereotypical thing here for the body type. What they mean based on the conference talk is stereotypical for that gender within video games. But then with what about like race as well? Yeah, because right. Because there are certain stereotypes that exist for a bunch of things and I guarantee yep. you that Garçon <laughs> is going to have a different stereotype than Gerald. Yeah, and like age factors into this as well. The stereotypical body for an old person is not the same as the stereotypical body for a young one. Or a middle-aged or a neither young nor old. Yeah, like none of this is taken into account in what they describe as quote-unquote stereotypical. They literally just mean gender. So your female And they've also stuffed up gender already. I know, right? <laughs> well, also like stereotypical within the, within the video game is not stereotypical in real life either. Like Yep. So your female <laughs> yeah. characters being slim, busty, long hair, tiny waist which and ankles which probably couldn't support their weight is considered stereotypical, while your male characters being slim, busty, and long hair would not be stereotypical. They get your, you know, Gears of War muscle stereotype instead. This is my boyfriend refrigerator <laughs> <laughs> and my girlfriend mop. Yes. <laughs> So on each of these axes, your character gets points between 0 and 10 based on how far, quote unquote, they are from this construction <laughs> of a norm. And because they're using numbers to do this, that implies the tool creators have come up with some idea of what it means to be two points away from male. On the one hand, I celebrate their step towards a more developed notion of gender in recognizing that it is at least non-binary. On the other hand, they're just slightly flattening the actual experience of gender. I'd also be interested genuinely in how they incorporate like traditional genders outside of the Western they don't paradigm. <laughs> yeah, because like <laughs> two steps away from male, like would that be like this is a known gender that's not male nor it's not a man or a woman it's um gosh the words escape me at the two spirit like, people in the the yeah yeah no, so that's from I was North America of the one starting with H from India um oh, or the Hajra. Polynesian one yeah or Is the Polynesian it? one where it's like you've had X number of the same sex child yeah and you're worried that the women's business of your family won't be passed down mm. so the next child is then understood to be the other gender for the sake of ritual yeah and there's also uh like in in new zealand there's uh, takatapui which is kind of a broad term for um well lgbtqia people it's been adopted from yeah. an older Māori term for same-sex partner. And, and a good mate of mine is um, from Wagga. His people are from Wagga. And his mum immediately understood what trans was. Like, ah, oh, brother boy, easy. Mm. And then didn't understand what bi was. <laughs> <laughs> that's so Because good. that's not, that's yeah, not yeah, rooted yeah. in the culture in the same way. Yeah. So, like, what is two steps from the norm? Yeah, is exactly. Is brother boy, like, more understandable than bi is... 
heteroflexible, yeah, more understandable <laughs> than trans. Oh, well, we'll get we'll get to like interesting examples of this. But what I will flag is that on your ten point scale for gender identity, uh, woman or female is five. <laughs> That sucks. So I have <laughs> I have accumulated all of the gender. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So <laughs> let's let's talk a bit more about this gender dimension, which sounds incredibly cool, but gender dimensions plural Welcome is to much the gender cool. dimension. Exactly. <laughs> Adi, this is kind of your speciality. So let's talk it about is. this. So I have come at gender from a bunch of different directions. I worked as a sociologist with a university. I analyzed artificial womb technology across decades of science fiction. And it's really, really interesting what people end up deciding gender means the moment they're forced to think about it for longer than <laughs> MF. Yes, like, my favourite set of pronouns comes from a virulent transphobe, which is unfortunate. What are they? Per, pers, person. Oh, that's cool. I like that. Yeah, like, per... like Shame about the source, but you know. Yeah, no, she she's not as bad as others, but like, she's in enough of the rad femme camp that it's just like, ah, oh, darling. Yeah. <laughs> but no, per, pers, person was intended to indicate that in a society where genetic and gestational labor is separated out from gender, you're able to have a more equal society. Mm. And it's less relevant what equipment you're packing because none of it will be packed with anything. Mm. It, it goes to the bottles and that's where they live now. The baby is brought to term safely and protected away from, you know, being carried around in a badly managed bodysuit. <laughs> So that actually, um, I, I won't lie. Some of the fact that I like that is it sounds like purr is in the cat noise. So like that I do could, understand that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'll start referring to my cat with those pronouns. I'm sure he won't mind. I've got a mate whose cat knows his pronouns because he's the only man in the house. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, he looks up whenever you hear his Jasper or he. Mm, mm. Finally, we have established that cats have gender. I mean, they have opinions about words. This is true. <laughs> Specifically things like treat. Yes. No, he didn't wake up. All right. <laughs> <laughs> With respect to like the dimensionality of gender, I mean, in particular in the context of something like a census question and, for, and that sort of thing, there are already two things that you need to kind of care about, perhaps three. One is like the actual label, if you will, yep. slash identity. What social um, roles you fill, what gendered components you have on your body, and what you choose to do about that, I guess, are kind of... Yeah, so I would kind of frame this mostly in the social role sort of setting, yeah. as distinct from your physiology. Yeah, because like with Overwatch in particular, like Mercy is a healer. Is she more femme than Zara, who is pink all over? Yes. Is she like I understand healers to be tops, like or, <laughs> or Dom? Ah, you, you've played MMOs. I have. <laughs> um, but no, like I like I played a character based on that archetype for a mm. Strad campaign who was a very, very Slavic um, lesbian mm. who reminded Strahd of his aunts, and so he, she was the only one who he didn't try to manipulate through flirtation. <laughs> he just looked at that and went, oh, no, 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 <laughs> no that, that's, that's my aunt. That's my aunt. I can't. I can't do this. Yeah. <laughs> so the physiology aspect actually has a bunch of stuff in it, because, for yeah. example, you have intersex physiology. Yep, and you have stere like they've already flagged stereotypical um, physiology. Body yeah, yeah, and so there is a really, really close connection for what they talk about as body type and gender, and yes. th they don't acknowledge this at all. But aside from intersex, being trans can have physiological aspects to it. We are intimately aware of what parts of our bodies are doing <laughs> things that we do not want them to do. <laughs> yeah, and this is distinct from cis physiology in a really quite important way. But then cis people can also be dysphoric about yes. things like hair or muscle or Infertility. fat tissue. 
infertility. Yes. And yeah. And even social role to a lesser oh, extent yeah, is sometimes grafted onto people because of their physiology. Yep. Like childbirthing hips. <laughs> oh God. I'm familiar with that one. The dump truck party over here. Yeah. <laughs> There's a really interesting spectrum here, it, uh, particularly uh, um, along like cis and intersex lines. So trans physiology is more something that you choose, theoretically. I mean, choice in transition is a really big question there. And then you can also look into race and stuff because you've yeah, got, absolutely. Um, different. Uh, you've got white people inflicting white binarism on people who just aren't like. Human bodies are not that sexually dimorphic. We're not peacocks and peahens <laughs> over here. Yeah, and, and the ways that there is sexual dimorphism is not binary. So there is a whole spectrum of things that are recognized now as intersex physiology, which range from some particular forms of, interfi- of infertility to hermaphrodism. And like, yeah. uh, uh, like what is known as, unfortunately, indistinct genitalia, which in the past has led to quite horrific medical abuse Fuck of infants. John Money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But all of this stuff comes into play with gender. And that's a whole set of dimensions on its own right that are not acknowledged in the single dimension of gender that uh, this, uh, this uh, system embraces. And you also see the beginnings of overlapping categories that just can't be overlapping on that model yeah like age and disability yep like there are certain assumptions that are made about age like i for instance have really shitty joints Mm. they're not arthritic they're just kind of shitty that is understood to be an old person's disease i steal old person valor with justification because i have arthritis under 30 so yep. you know a oh. mate of mine joey has the same <laughs> that is something that changes the physiological experience of the world and the physiological stereotype as well and you also have like puberty yep i was one shape throughout all of all of my childhood and then i very rapidly had second puberty Mm. i really didn't like it i went from being like don't know what that is that's a student i guess that's an older (laughs) sibling to a wooga a chest yes It, it was just very uncomfortable and very quick but like it wasn't at the time that puberty normally happens so Mm. is that gender is that age is that ability because the reason that that happened was because I was finally on hormones that would actually work with my body. Mm. And I mean, I didn't enjoy it. I didn't want this to be happening. Is that age? Yeah. Is that gender? Is that social role? Is that ability? So you can construct these different dimensions in if you, if you want to build a mathematical model for gender. And I think that there are arguments for it being a useful exploratory tool, although I'm not convinced it's a useful classification tool. Those are kind of different things. But you can also, within that, you can have a bunch of different dimensions and then have really strong relationships between them for some people. So there is a lot more you can get out of this than what this particular tool is trying to do. Are you familiar with Stephen Coleman's work? Not by name. Okay. He looked at pregnancy through a tripicked model. Okay. Where like you have a you have social parent, genetic parent, and gestational parent. Yes, okay, that makes sense, yeah. And the reason that social roles are unbalanced is because you can really only have one gestational parent. Mm. He was looking at it in terms of ethics and artificial wombs, but that's a kind of modular structure that allows for a lot more possibilities within... Yeah, and you can say that within that framework, for most cases, those are strongly correlated. Your gestational parent is probably going to be one of your biological parents. Is probably and your going social to parent be is probably... Social- yeah. yeah. So you can say that there are strong correlations between these three things without saying that they all have to be collapsed into one. And that's No, and they physically can't be is one of the reasons why I really like this system. There yeah. is already a category that is going to have to be thought about. Differently. Yeah, and like it doesn't exclude people whose social parents don't raise them. Yep. It doesn't exclude people who were b- born through a surrogate. Yeah. It just, it it's a modular structure that allows for a lot more accuracy. Yes. 
in a way that I think you'd want from a tool like this. Yeah, and this is one of the reasons that this single dimension of gender pisses me off so much, is that it is so inaccurate to the lived experience of people. I have a 50% gender! (laughs) (laughs) Well, there's actually one other thing that I want to add to this, which is, like, intensity of gender. (laughs) (laughs) Right? Because, I mean, like, a gender is one way of talking about this. I use she, they pronouns, and I use they mostly because I just don't have a strong gender identity. But I know that there are non-binary people who experience a lot of gender that is neither male or female. So you yep. can have like really interesting discussion on intensity here, which is not really captured in just having a sing- even a single scale of male to female. And this is also where transphobes get mired in the weeds real fucking fast. <laughs> yeah. Because they're like, it's not feeling pink and fluffy and compliant. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, no, that's not what that is. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, it's about the pain, the pain of childbirth. And it's like, it's not really that either. <laughs> yeah. Um, yep. Physiology is just one part of it. Right. And yeah, one of the and things. You can feel that different intensities. Yeah. So I want to, I want to demonstrate this with a really quite rudimentary sort of mathematical model for gender which is two axes, we'll put female down here and male here. So basically, Why female and male and not man and woman? Ease of terminology, I guess, in this context. Because, cool. Yeah, also because man and woman implies age. I can understand that, but I'd also argue that the gen- there is a role of child, which is yes. expected outside of sex. Yes, but there is also a role of female child, which is quite distinct. Yeah, so- true. Yeah, so as I said, this is a very rudimentary model. The reason I want to say this is that you can have somebody who is female exclusively and quite intensely female who lives about here. Somebody who is female, but eh, whatever, kind of not as intensely who lives here. Somebody who considers themselves exclusively and intensely male. Or somebody like me who's kind of between male and female, more on the female side, but I don't experience gender intensely. So I'd put myself right about like here. Pretty close to what I would call zero on both of these axes, a little bit more towards the femme side, but like not, I'm certainly not like here, for example. And even within this kind of two dimensional system, you can get both that masculine, feminine, male, female sort of dimensions in there, and you get intensity of gender, which is not itself an axis in this system, but is instead a notion of distance. Ooh, you're from, bringing it back to distance. Yeah, the zero. So yeah. in, in this context, you can have a meaningful idea of what distance means, even if you can't like quantify it. Like, I can't say that this person is one from zero <laughs> and I'm like 0.2 or something like that. And the- it also makes space for a lot of queering of terms. Like yeah. the gender that I find the most appealing is mask dandy. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, like a zero fail, um, steed bonnet, that kind of. I'm having a great time with my gender, and I'm doing it a lot, but I'm not like going to get like it's not related to masculine or feminine as much mm. as it is just. I'm fucking fabulous. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I am. I am. I am going to show you my magnificent calves, and I made this <laughs> tailcoat. Yeah. <laughs> So what this shows is that if you are careful about it and you are careful about the interpretation, like I am using this in a kind of ordered fashion, but yes. not a numerical fashion because those things are quite distinct. You can it's get- also not rigid in yeah. the way that the current model they're using is. Yeah, so you can use a spatial model for gender which is meaningful and useful and exploratory, and you can talk interesting things about it, they haven't done this. No. I'd genuinely be really interested to see the comparison of someone like Moira and someone like Mercy, who are set up as foils and have very similar body types, yes. but have different understandings of woman, question mark, to my brain. Yeah. So uh, for those who haven't played um, Overwatch, Mercy is a character we're going to talk about a bit later, who is your kind of archetypal female healer. Moira is um, also female, but is kind of like an evil scientist who does bad things to people. 
and a venomous little bog witch. I love her. <laughs> She's great. She was my favorite character when I played. <laughs> She's also fucking fabulous as well. <laughs> oh boy, yes. I'd put her in the masked dandy category too. <laughs> <laughs> but would she put herself? <laughs> yeah, and, and that's where this scale is useful because you she might find something in the realm of that. Mm. But she might also go, no, but from the outside as a character, you can sort of look at it that way. But that's the other thing too, like the hell is Winston the gorilla's gender? Yeah, and this is actually something I wanted to bring up quite explicitly. There is a canonically gender neutral character in Overwatch that is gender neutral as opposed to non-binary. That character is a robot. Oh, it's Bastion? No, um, it's a new one whose name I can't remember. I'm sorry. I looked it up for this to just see are there actually like canonically trans or non-binary characters. The only like non, as far as I can tell, non-canonically cisgendered character is this character who is a robot. Other robots have gender. That one just uses they them. So. <laughs> They named it Lynx, like the body spray. <laughs> so this is a shortcoming in the kind of Overwatch diversity thing, which is separate to a shortcoming in this particular tool. Because as I think one of the character writers mentioned, Overwatch doesn't use this. But their understanding of what gender looks like is kind of not as developed as it perhaps could be. Because relegating your only gender neutral slash non-binary character to be a robot, a little bit condescending there. Like, yep. you, you could have- Oh, I'm cold and unfeeling, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm convinced. But, like, they could have had a you know, human character with that before they made it a robot. And I think that would have been a little bit better, I suppose, if they are really interested in representing diversity. It's also interesting, there's a video essay by a lady named Jessie Gender about Star Trek mm. and about how Star Trek focused, like Gene Roddenberry explicitly said he focused on racial justice before sexual and social justice in the sense of gender and sexuality mm. because he thought that he would be more able to get that past the senses. Mm. Yeah. And Overwatch has seemingly followed a similar footstep where it is doing, it is a, it is very clearly attempting to do something with its diversity and its visible diversity, and some things just get left behind. Like if you don't read the comics, you don't know that Trace is a lesbian. Yeah. If you don't look at Moira, you don't know that she's a lesbian for sure. Um, <laughs> although those nails, though. Um, <laughs> then you have look. She's got a little um, bit of the high femme lesbian. As yeah, she's she's got. She, you're telling me a queer coded this lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> this is particularly interesting. Uh, talking about what diversity is in Overwatch. If we come back to this and we look at these kind of culture and ethnicity groupings, so these are, shall we say, slightly problematic and US centric. <laughs> right? They, Overwatch has an extremely international cast, but they don't really grapple with like the notion of ethnicity, which is a euphemism for race. So one of the characters we'll talk about is Brazilian from a favela in Rio de Janeiro. Brazil has a whole like fucked up history of colonization and racism related to that colonization, which doesn't map particularly well onto the kind of ethnicities that the US understands. So yeah. the way that this character Lucio as like a poor Brazilian is represented within the context of this understanding of ethnicity and culture would not really correspond very well to how a person who comes from a favela in Rio de Janeiro with his like skin color would actually understand it. And like there's so much of this particular tool's representation of culture, which is very homogenizing and very kind of imperialist. American. Yeah, it's very American. That's a good way to think like, about it. It's a very particular kind of imperialism. Like, it's not Spanish imperialism. Yes. So, like, their their notion of what looks like Western culture is Western from an, a, a uh, US lens, where US is the hegemon, as opposed to, like, the UK or, like, Central Europe and things like that. Or Australia, like we have oh, yeah. certain understandings of white that would confuse, like, I don't know how uh, England or America would handle the concept of Walt. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, 
but don't like call, don't call people so that in the US has a advice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because yeah, it's just God. Over there. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah it comes yeah. from Gollywog, doesn't it? Oh no, <laughs> yeah, it's very bad. So over here, it's uh, well, it, it was originally kind of a slur for um, Italian migrants, but it's now kind of transformed a bit. It's I don't think it's necessarily used as a slur now. Um, it's it's a known category that people define themselves within or without. Yeah, like I come from a woggy household means my parents were. My parents or grandparents came over to Australia in the 30s, 40s, 50s. Yeah. Um, and we have strong feelings about our home culture while also understanding ourselves as broadly Australian. Yeah. So there's also kind of um, interesting aspects of that where in like the different shades of being white in Europe don't carry across to American experiences of that. Like – you can be racist against white people if the white people are Polish and you're in the UK, for example. Ooh, that's yes. extremely <laughs> common. This whole conceptualizing of culture and ethnicity, for one thing, their classification of Western and Caucasian as the norm is fucked. For two, how you measure distance is fucked. Because they're talking about how, like, in ethnicity, realistically, that axis is uh, how brown are you? Which is like, shall we say, slightly problematic. Let's go with that. <laughs> across Let's history. just leave it at that for yeah. now. Yeah. And, and for culture, it's kind of a question of like how culturally dif- distant, quote unquote, are you from North America in the UK? And, and also, how obnoxious are you being about it? <laughs> if you're going to put it in the worst possible framing. Yeah. So, like. One of the things about the lack of data on this is that we can't go and look at all the other characters to get a deeper understanding of this. Because there's an Australian character. And I have. Is there? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so Junkrat is the canonically Australian oh! character. Oh! Yes! I'd forgotten about him. He's such a parody that I just put him in my brain as <laughs> rat. Yeah, right? So J- Junkrat is the canonically Australian character, he's a white Australian. So, um, but he's, I would say he's also his offsider and his offsider would be more Maori kind of. Yeah. So Roadhog is, I believe, canonically Maori. Um, would Junkrat understand himself as Pakeha? Well, no, because that's a New Zealand thing, not an Australian thing. Yeah. But would America make that distinction? They, look, if they knew what Pakeha was, they would know enough to not consider Australians in that framework. Understandable. Yeah. So it, I just sorry. I just looked it up. According to the wiki, Roadhog is actually also Australian, which does not mean he's necessary. Not Maori, for example. I live in Australia, and I am Maori as well as Pakeha, which means that I have Maori ancestry as well as European ancestry. But yep. it does mean that he's not listed as being a New Zealander. But that is like, oh, <laughs> I know. I right? really don't like that. Yeah. So like. He would have opinions about this as a character. Yeah, absolutely. Like, whether or not he considers himself really connected to New Zealand or not, he would have opinions about this. Like, the Stolen Generation in Australia was different to the Stolen Generation in New Zealand. Yep. But, like, the 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 same prejudices existed based on similar structures that were slightly distinct. Yeah, so the the colonisation histories of New Zealand and Australia are, like, fascinating foils for each other. Um, yeah. th- they were both bad in their own way. Uh, I think that Maori people in New Zealand were more able to organize in a way that, yes. like, the size of Australia and the sparsity of, like, it- it's a very also long way to f- get, you know, to organize. And also the organize. mental pigeonhole that the colonizers put um, them in. And also the yeah. like, common language of the Maori people helped out with. Uh, that as well. True. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yes. It's very much easier to organize. I mean, it wasn't like it was certainly far less diverse than the hundreds of different language families that exist in Australia. But like, there was at least a much more common language that you could use to organize in New Zealand. So yeah. there's a lot. We, we don't know where Roadhog and Junkrat would fit on this culture thing because we have no data for them. But I suspect. I mean, it would be entirely in character for Junkrats to just be a little like a him standing there holding a bomb, the data in disarray <laughs> behind him. <laughs> yeah, right. But I think 
Like, it would not surprise me if, for one, both of these characters get classified as white, and for two, both of these cla- characters get classified as Western because they're identified as being Australian. Oh, yeah, obviously, they're from <laughs> Perth. Let me be clear that I'm not entirely sure whether or not Roadhog is meant to have Maori ancestry. but He certainly has Maori design ins- inspirations. Yeah, and his name Mako makes me... I, I, I'm not sure if that is actually a Maori name, but it wouldn't surprise me if it was meant to be sound like one. Also, the hook that he has... So yeah, uh, that's that looks an awful lot like one of the kind of Maori design um, motifs, which is like a fish hook in the same like well, I guess Maori and Pacifica more generally. So yeah. I I'm not sure if that's deliberate, but it sure as hell looks like it could be. Yeah, someone somewhere had a thought. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah, like whether that's been intentionally kept throughout the design or whether that's just kind some, of a, a, a hangover from. A uh, previous design. I mean, if you if you play those um, what are they called? Banjo Kazooie games back in the day. Yes, it was meant to be Australia, but all the symbolism was like Polynesian of some variety or another. So, like, uh, I think that's uh, uh, oh, yeah. a common like stereotype. And Crash Bandicoot that's as what well. I was of. I'm not mm. a gamer. Um, <laughs> I've played. <laughs> <laughs> Look, somebody has to I've not be. I guess that's you on this podcast. High school, they're all on my Steam account. I'll put them in the show notes. So there is a lot of homogenizing going into these, and we'll look a bit more at that later when we come across an explicit example. I'm also going to come uh, to flag an upcoming tirade about this ability access. <laughs> Um, At some point, we're going to do a whole episode on quantifying disability and the eugenics history of that effort. And we'll talk... Oh, dear. Yeah, we'll talk more about the problems with this axis when we have an example in front of this. Before we go to examples, though, it's worth talking about this graphic here. These are called radar or star plots. They're a way of representing higher dimensional data where you have some list of values for each dimension put a point on the corresponding axis, and then draw a curve around the plot representing the thing you're looking at. So this green line in the middle of here is actually representing that this norm has a zero points on each of these axes. If you had somebody who had, for example, a a gender up here, but all the rest was zero, you would get a shape that looked like had, had a point up there and then came around to this bit in the middle. The problem with using something like this is that the way that these plots are constructed, you're meant to interpret the area inside the curve as meaningful. So the area inside this thing in the middle theoretically is zero because it's zero and everything, but you could also just think about it as this bit in here. If we add on this spike out to some higher gender identity points, you would include this bit out here. So you can see that the character assigned to the who gets norm values on all of these axes contains less area than the character who has norm for most of them and non-norm for something else, right? Yep. In this case, the, how you would read that is more area would mean, quote-unquote, more diverse. But that's not what it's intended to be. So the research paper that was done for the MIT Game Lab explicitly talks about the fact that you can't really say that because like the order in which you write these matters. To show you what I mean, I'm going to show you a simplified version. So imagine we have, instead of seven axes, we have four. So we're going to draw two down here, right? On this one, I'm going to label them A, B, C, and D going around clockwise. On the second one, I'm going to label them A, C, B, D, right? So I've changed the order of B and C in the second case. So in this first one, imagine we have like, zero on D and B, and close to whatever the maximum is on A and C. So we get this sort of elongated diamond shape. We have the same points values, but a different order on the second one. So we have out near the maximum value on A and C, and close in the middle on D and B. And this gives us a kind of trapezoidal shape, which has a lot more area in it, because A and C next to each other have this bigger area enclosed here. The order in which you put these axes in this star plot implies something about the relationship between those variables that the people who are using it in the context of this tool don't intend to be implied. This is a problem, right? Because if you know 
that your graphic is consistently misinterpreted, if you know that you have to care about the ordering because something about the the way you represent the data will imply relationships that don't exactly actually exist, don't use that visualization. Are these all um, weighted the same? Fuck knows. <laughs> How would you weight the difference between early onset arthritis and woman? Yeah, like, so we'll see that the gender identity on a 0 to 10 scale, if 5 is female, oh, sorry, 5 is woman, 0 is male, how they've actually stated it here, what is 10? Like, and and that 0 to 5 difference between male and, and, sorry, between male and female, they've written male here as opposed to man, which is very annoying with how they've phrased it elsewhere, but whatever. They are somehow intending to compare that to a zero to five difference in sexual orientation or ability or age. So this is one of the problems when you start using numbers and you start trying to measure things and you start acting like you can measure consistently across different factors. Numbers have structure that this does not. Stop using them. (laughs) Do you want eugenics? Because this is among the many horrific ways you get eugenics. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, even if it's done for supposedly non-eugenics purposes in the sense that they claim that this is being done to increase diversity, which is kind of a eugenics sort of thing, I guess. Yeah. But, it, like, yeah, you can you can run into problems with that, that immediately. It's following, right? like, it is genuinely a part of the eugenics um, self-understanding, I guess, that a good eugenicist can beat a bad eugenicist. <laughs> like, we're doing it right this time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's not something I find comforting from a diversity tool. Yeah, right. We're going to do it right this time. Yeah. <laughs> well, I feel like that's a problem with uh, scientism as, a, as distinct from oh, science yeah. itself in yep. general. Is uh, Yeah. No, like, it's not a problem about, like... It's a problem with how it's framed and understood rather than a problem with... um, But but it plays into the exact problem that you're talking about where it's like, ah, the numbers are making a bigger area. Yeah. That means this person is more diverse than that person and therefore we will put them forward. Yes. And it's like, that is is a silverback gorilla? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. His culture is moon? <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> but even from the supposedly woke angle, it seems like, for example, I know that we live in a quite ageist society and the elderly are often treated badly, but I feel like, for example, um, ethnicity is a stronger like uh, discriminatory factor than age often. like. But it also depends on your level of infirmity yes. in age. Like, my nan has a broken hip and pretty bad dementia at this point. That is going to put her in a different age category than my great aunt, who is 10 years her senior, but doesn't have the mental issues. Yeah, so this is kind of where age and ability kind of intersect as well. Yeah. Oh boy, we're going to talk about ability in a second, because... But they are really using age as an aesthetic thing here. Yeah. It's about how fuckable they are, not about... (laughs) (laughs) That is MILF Hunter Erasure. I'm sorry. (laughs) I'm not... I'm not... Like, I would put that in neither young nor old because they're still MILF. They're still... Um, yeah, but potentially, like potentially a gestational parent. But as, Look, we'll get to that in a second. There are know, examples to talk about here. Know, uh, MILF is a sociological category as well as a <laughs> gendered category. Yeah, no, yeah. there are certain qualities to a person before they become a MILF. <laughs> mm-hmm. So there's another aspect of this that I want to talk about with a little bit more of like statistical terminology. If you have two of these axes separated by a third, right? So in this case, you're thinking of your A and your C separated by B here. They are independent. That is, they don't interact with each other in terms of uh, like determining this kind of area within the curve sort of relationship. That is a statistical property, whereas two things next to each other, because they both determine the area inside the curve and they determine where the curve itself goes, They have a relationship. Anytime you are using a curve to represent some character's kind of total properties on this schema, you are claiming relationships between adjacent um, axes. 
And that's something that you can't do without some extremely rigorous consideration. Because you can't say that, in this example, culture is related only to gender identity and ethnicity. It's independent from age, ability, and sexual orientation and body type, precisely because it's only adjacent to two of these things and none of the others. If you're going to construct something that has these sorts of, like, variable relationships you have to support it with some evidence yeah and also like they don't seem to map on particularly well to even the ones that they're beside even leaving out like i'm pretty sure that culture and sexual orientation are gonna have some interplay Mm. but like why is age why what does age have to do with ethnicity yeah why doesn't age exist beside body type Yeah, so, like, overall, this representation of the data is extremely poor and shouldn't be used. And the fact that the article that you sent me um, is like, yeah, no, you can move those around willy-nilly. Yeah. (laughs) right. You can just move those. Yeah. That doesn't mean anything. How the (laughs) hell are you meant to compare them? Well, that's the thing. So what they are kind of constructing here is what we call in maths a norm, which is distinct from the way that norm is used here. So norm in mathematics is kind of used to measure the size of things. In this case, the norm is kind of this area within the curve, which they are claiming doesn't actually exist as a norm within this data set, but they're still presenting- Despite the fact that they named it the space thing. Yeah, it's pretty bad. And I think that this is a problem in the publication as well as a problem in the tool itself, right? If you have a valid way to measure diversity along these axes, and let me reiterate, they do not, then you can actually (laughs) build much more meaningful ways of comparing diversity across characters. They are called norms, different kind of norms. To do this in a valid fashion, you also need to have the same scale on all of your axes, so that five points for female as opposed to male, compared to whatever the fuck you would do with culture, you have to be really careful. And if you can sort that out, the most basic norm you could do would be to add up all the points values. So, like, if you have zero across the board, right, you get a norm overall of zero. If you have, like, zero for most things, but let's say you've got a two in culture, a two in ethnicity, and a one in sexual orientation, whatever that means, you would add these up and this person, in, this character in blue would get five points. You can use that as, like, a numerical comparison to say that the person with five points is, quote unquote, more diverse than the person with zero. Like, or possibly has more potential for diversity. Yeah. Like, both of these are kind of, like, cooked ways of referring to it and not valid yeah. because their number system is not valid. But, yeah, yeah, you, you can think about it like this. And if we come back to, like, where did I draw that? If we, if we come back to our model here for gender, like, you can measure the norm in this context would be the distance from the origin to a point. And you can say that, like, me down here doesn't have a lot of gender because that's not a very long sort of arrow, whereas this person here has considerably more gender. This person out here has a lot of gender going on. (laughs) And you can talk about that as a kind of ordering. So somebody experiences more or less gender than another person without necessarily kind of having numbers associated with it. Or even potentially what that experience of gender is. Yeah, so it's it's quite reductive to talk about this, but you can use it to inform a broader discussion. Yes. It is a useful starting point in a way that the current tool is too confusing to manage. Too confusing, very badly set up. Uses numbers wrong. <laughs> numbers don't do this. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, no, like it's like it's 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 like it's like looking at a first like studying's first year so like when I was teaching first year sociology we had an engineering student oh fun who oh oh it gets so much worse <laughs> he was an international student who had friends in his engineering degree and he was like hey I need an easy A so that I can <laughs> maintain my scholarship yeah what's an easy A and these dude bro chuds said Go do gender sociology. studies <laughs> <laughs> How did he go? Well, his first assignment, he plagiarized almost entirely from Chinese language Wikipedia. Hell yeah. (laughs) Nice. It did include the baller line, when bisexual people meet their perfect opposite sex partner, they will form Voltron like Plato predicted. Oh my god, fuck yeah. (laughs) 
I, I know the myth that he's talking about, and I'm also like, so only bisexuals can have a soulmate? <laughs> Fascinating. I want to read that essay. <laughs> um, but I was like, hey, you can't, this isn't engineering, you can't just copy an answer from the internet. <laughs> you need to do some thinking about it. And he's like, okay. And then he went and plagiarized off a, I forget what nation she was, but an indigenous Australian um, scholar about black indigenous australian women oh i'm sure that was real healthy (laughs) i mean it was pretty much verbatim her work so it was good quality work but it was definitely not not his students work (laughs) yeah coming from sociology and linguistics into maths was very very interesting because maths students in general are not quite so chuddish as your physics and your engineering students. Yeah, doesn't surprise me. There's more flexibility in maths. Well, not just that, but you have to think an awful lot harder about numbers if you're a math student. Yeah. And like, what do and do they not work for? Like, there, there are some exceptions to this, obviously, and some extremely cooked units that I know through maths who are my dude my dude my dude you have those in gender studies yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh god they, 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 look they they pop up everywhere uh, they just happen to congregate in and physics engineering and things like that well that's where they're told that they're that's they're, where they're told they're right all the time and it's also where they're culturally like the the culture of numbers breeds that kind of incuriosity mm. where like in any number of other things like even accounting versus economics mm. accounting is more thinking about what applications you're going to use critically yeah and also you have to deal with actual money and people if you're an accountant and whereas actual econ- test cases yeah whereas economists can just pull whatever out of their asses oh yeah no i'm a genderless <laughs> completely apathetic robot who is a perfect rational actor. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. And of course has perfect access to information, yes. Indeed. And I don't have to do anything about it (laughs) either. I just have information pinged to me at all times. Yeah. It's like, um, I think economics, the problem there is that it's not actually designed to do anything except be a cheerleader for the capitalist order. (laughs) Like, <laughs> yeah. It's Although not- I would, I would argue that Marx was also an economist, but an economist who was thinking about it more as an analysis of the world as opposed to a tool to reinforce hegemony. Which is how you end up with Engels and his dis- his work on the second shift and the woman. Yeah. In this- Political economy used to be taught as a separate subject to economics, though. Um, is it, yeah, it doesn't not, surprise still? me. No, uh, they've gotten rid of most of the political economy classes, uh, is my understanding. Of course. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> people kept coming out of them going, hey, perhaps we should care about other people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. All right. So I'm going to wrangle us back and show you some examples because I think that they are worth talking about. So this was the. <laughs> I know, right? So this was the banner image for the original blog post. We have three example characters here. First, here in pink is Zarya, second is Lucio, and third is Torbjorn. Torbjorn, you uncultured swine! <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to talk about them. These three, as examples, also appeared in the 2017 conference presentation, because why would you develop anything else when you can just reuse it? First up, we have Zarya. She is a Russian champion weightlifter. She scores high in the body type because she is tall and jacked and look honestly goals. <laughs> and this is not considered stereotypical for a female character. Because she is Russian, she is non-zero on culture, but because she's also white-skinned, which means her ethnicity is the default, she scores zero. A zero zero on the or one. Ooh, that is interesting with Russians. Huh. Yeah, I know, right? Well, look, especially ooh, of late. Yeah, right. <laughs> she may well, in fact, be canonically Caucasian because there's the part in southern Russia which is actually in the Caucasus. The Caucasus. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I'm not convinced that whoever built this has any idea what that would actually mean. No, they basically no, just... they just know it from the name of the racist skull <laughs> because he found it in the Caucasus. Yeah, they look at her and they go, "Oh, she's white." Yeah. That's a white. That's a white. <laughs> Put her under white in the ethnicity, right? I'm not mm. defending like Vladimir Putin or anything, but I think you can make an argument that uh, Russians are being racialized in a new and interesting way these days. Well, they're being discriminated against, <laughs> but we're also running up against the yeah. um, capstone of white as an identity. Yeah. Because like mm. there are distinct cultural differences between Poland and Germany and Russia. 
they exist outside of the American scope, where the American understands them all as pertaining to whiteness. Yeah. And that's a circle that can grow or shrink as needed. And at the minute, it is shrinking to exclude Russians. Yeah. So the idea, um, like dating back a long way, of the Slavic person is like, well, it was constructed during the era of like the Soviet Union and things. As a, well, it was before that as well because yeah. you had you had Hitler referring to the Slavs as essentially like having essential traits yes. that made them lesser than the other European Germanic races. And, yeah, yeah, and like the the current Russian imperialist expansion into Ukraine is kind of resurfacing a whole lot of this stuff in a in a way that is going to like let's just say it's going to fuck over a lot of people who themselves oppose that imperialist violence i think it's fucking stupid to bl- like do we have do we have to be blamed the same way for the iraq war if uh, well are- some of us do let's be <laughs> tony blair should no, no. be in prison yeah, oh, no, no. Let's, but- <laughs> let's, let's be very very clear about that a lot of people supported the iraq war at the time they should be blamed for it not everyone so there, there is a whole other discussion to be had there. We're going to wrench this back again. All right. So. <laughs> Sorry. <man>. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's Russian, so she's non-zero on culture. She's white, so she her ethnicity is zero on there. Zarya is also straight, fairly young, and doesn't have a disability. Is she straight? I know. Yeah. <laughs> Canonically, yes. I honestly thought she was bi. Look, look, let me phrase again. As far as I know, she is straight, and certainly they have published this, putting her at the heterosexual point on their <laughs> schema. Which means, yeah. So That's from a- this, we can say she is straight, right? Follow-up question. Is she single? <laughs> <laughs> Look, if you want to get your head crushed like a watermelon, I'm sure she would be able to do it. <laughs> if I was not bad, who would crush man's head like sparrow <laughs> egg between thighs? Exactly, right? To go back to culture and whiteness, Torshborn is very clearly, like, European. Yeah, so... Like, he's Germanic. Yeah. Why is he less culture than... Like, is he less culture? Yeah, he's less culture than both... No, no, so, Zarya and yeah, yeah, yeah. Lucio. So, um, is he? Let me just check whether or not he is. Because uh, he looks like a Viking. Yeah. That's the design that they're following. Well, he looks like a fantasy dwarf. Yes. Yes. He's Swedish. So that. There. Yeah. So this is really interesting in terms of like constructing the idea of culture. Being Swedish is considered Western. Being Russian is not. Yeah. So, mm, yeah. But let's and also, Lu- Lucio is only at like two culture. <laughs> oh no! So um, this is a zero. Two is labeling him as number two over here. He's actually at like oh, a no. five ish. Oh, not ethnicity. I'm talking culture. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry. So he's he's considered as distant from Western, being from a favela in Brazil, as a Russian person is. Yeah, but le- more so than the Swede. Yes. But less so, or as much so as the Ruski. Yes, exactly. Right. Let's talk a bit more about uh, Lucio. Actually, basically, the reason that he gets ranked so high on ethnicity is because he's black skinned or dark skinned and has uh, and has dread- of hair. Yeah, he has dreadlocks. So because this is an ethnicity, we'll call it, let's just call it race because they're using ethnicity as a euphemism there for race. Because yeah, they're fra- which is incorrect. <laughs> right? Because their framework of what that looks like is based on, like, shall we say, US, UK, that sort of global north classifications, they put him here. Apparently, um, he used to have a higher rating, but there were something like complaints or whatever, so that got ratcheted back. What that argument was, I have no fucking idea. Because <laughs> this, this, these number values have no real meaning. You know what I bet it is? What? I bet, uh, like, the Brazilian market is, like, pretty elite in terms of, like, who, who has access uh, to these yeah. games. And they had some pushback to being... Uh, yeah, maybe. So Brazilian constructions of race are very, very interesting because they have, like, a whole kind of extremely racist but very interesting taxonomy of like skin color and whether or not somebody is like descended from the spanish or dutch colonizers versus whether they have indigenous ancestry versus whether they have black african slave ancestry because a lot of the colonization of brazil involved bringing over huge numbers of african slaves by like dutch and um spanish 
slave fleets to work on plantations. And in, in some respects, it's an interesting foil for the American system because they both have indigenous populations who were pushed out, uh, like African slaves who were brought over to be slaves on plantations and things. And then, and you also have then to contrast, you have South South Africa which has both the Afrikaans from the Dutch, yes. the English from the Boers, and you have the people who were not taken away to do slavery but were instead enslaved on their own place. Yes. So that is also going to build a different and distinct culture and different and distinct understanding of whiteness. Yep. And I know that they have a pretty – and they also have a pretty sizable Chinese population as well. Mm. And a friend of mine is the kid of a white Africana who, like, went in the Olympics for Rhodesia when it was Rhodesia. Ooh, fuck. <laughs> and he married a black, um, a black and Chinese lady. Okay. And his mum was his mum was absolutely livid about the fact that she was mixed more so than the fact that she wasn't white. I think fun right. fundamentally the, the American uh, experience of race has to be at least partly tracked back to um, the one drop. One drop, yeah. 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 Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, all of those nonsense. And yeah. Australia did the same thing and did so with um, more of an aim to eradicate than did yeah. America. So blood quantum is another thing that I have quite strong opinions of and oh, tend fuck. to do an episode about. So th in this if you have me back, I will scream. <laughs> I will scream for many hours. Well, I'm planning to uh, get an Indigenous Australian activist. Good. Yes. And Good. Yeah, th that's going to be a really interesting episode as well. Okay, so back to Lucio. So aside from being Brazilian and dark-skinned, he gets zero on all the other axes because he's a young, fit, straight guy. Now let's talk about Torbion. Our short king. <laughs> so it's not clear in the canon whether or not he's actually a little person. He's built more along the lines of your classic blizzard fantasy dwarf. So think wow and that sort of thing. But he does get some points under the body type uh, for being shorter than your usual male character. But what I really want to use him to talk about is ability. Oh boy, let's get into it. So there's a theory that comes out of disability rights, known as the social theory of disability. It's not perfect, there are crit quite valid criticisms of it and other frameworks, but it offers a really useful distinction that I want to employ here. There is a difference between an impairment and a disability. An impairment is the physiology of a person. A disability is the way that structural barriers in the environment limit a person's ability to interact with the world because of their impairment. My favourite example here is, on the one hand, needing glasses, which is an impairment in the sense that you can't see as well, but if you have access to glasses, contacts, or whatever other like tool you use to correct your vision, it's not really a disability. For example, I have a reasonably strong prescription for being very short-sighted. But in my day-to-day... -day trying your glasses on as a kid, <laughs> it was intense. It's gotten worse. But like, Hey, same! Yeah! But like, when I wear my glasses, it doesn't really impact my ability to interact with the world. If I have to take my glasses off to do boxing, it's a bit of a, a problem there. But other than that, it's not a disability for me to need glasses. I compare this to being left-handed. I would say that being left-handed is not an impairment because you are just as dexterous, but it looks a hell of a lot like a disability when most objects that are produced are produced to be used by right-handed people. Like, lecture theatres is kind of a classic example here. Oh, fuck. It yeah, if you have those, like, shitty little tables that fold up from the armrest, they'll basically all be designed for right-handed people. Maybe you'll have a couple that are on the other side so they can be used by somebody who writes left-handed. But what this is, is that universities have used those constructions because they are cheaper than benches or tables that are big enough to come up from one side and be used by people who are writing on both sides. So it's a matter of cost-cutting producing a disability structure for people who are left-handed. It's a structural barrier to writing notes in lectures for a group of people with a slightly different physiology. I viscerally remember the desks that fold over like that because I am very tall. Yes. I am six foot tall. I 
was going to Sydney basically every evening to visit my sister in hospital. And so I was also very tired all yeah. the time. When I get tired, sometimes the muscle in my leg will start to twitch. Mm. It makes a big, loud rattling noise <laughs> oh, because dear. of the shitty construction of the fold-out desk. Yeah. And I can't unfold it because I'm taking notes on that. Yeah. I can't put my notebook in my lap because my leg has decided that now is the time to audition for fucking Footloose. <laughs> and yeah, everyone looks at you. Yes. And you're making a scene because you are just not shaped on the median of what they expected this particular day. Yeah, and like another example is aeroplane seats for tall people, aeroplane seats for large people as well. So there are all these structures. Or people with um, prosthetics. Yeah. So there are all of these structures in our environment, stairs rather than ramps, which produce disability in that they limit people's ability to interact with the world. When those are choices that have, have the been broader made. Structures too. Yeah, absolutely. Where you have, like in England, where there's a lot of heritage buildings, they have started to come up with nifty ways to hide ramps mm. so that they can still be used functionally while also accommodating people. Yeah. But it still says to the disabled people, our pretty marbled stairs are more important to us than you. Than, yeah, your ability to come into the museum. Yeah. So, back to Torbjorn. He's missing an arm and an eye and may or may not be a little person, but these things do not in any way affect his interaction with the game world. He has the same field of view as every other character, can interact with all the objects in the game world, and I don't know if his movement speed is slightly slower than other characters. I think he moves a little bit slower than the very fastest character, but he has an ability which makes him move faster because of robot armor. So he has impairments, but functionally, he does not have a disability. Precisely because to actually have a disability in this game would drastically affect the gameplay and balance. The same is true of other characters with impairments too. For example, closing off part of a player's field of view to represent a character missing an eye would never fly in a video game. This supposed ability disability access is purely aesthetic. If someone likes playing a character with a prosthetic limb because they have one, more power to them. But it's just wrong for this particular developer or any other person to claim that this is a genuine representation of diversity in ability. I'm also willing to bet money that they didn't talk to a single disability activist or theorist about this because they would probably have been told to shove it if they did. There is an example I can think of of another character with a missing limb and a missing eye in a shooter of this nature, Demo Man, yes. who in the comics has made reference to the fact that, yeah, no, he can't see out of that eye. And in his video, he makes reference to the fact that, like, all of the other characters are, quote, rollicking around with their heads full of eyeballs. Yes. Like, it existed a decade before Torborn, Torbjorn, and in in that game, think it, that it would have in that game it doesn't impact the gameplay either. So like, no, but you have them lampshading it yeah. after the fact in a way that would make sense for someone who is into this kind of gaming to mm. go. Oh yeah, if I have a one eyed character, odds are good it's gonna have some kind of effect. Yeah. How they've dealt with disability in this context is really quite representative of how they deal with the rest of it. It is basically aesthetic at best and even then not comprehensive in its aesthetics yeah right so let's actually have a look at the other things so we actually have an example of the details for a particular character uh this character is called anna uh she is the mother of another character i think yes anyway, yeah she is she's the mother of farah she is also impaired she's missing an eye which as a sniper you would think would be an even bigger problem than as a brawler well, no, I mean, snipers only use one eye to look through the scope. Wait, is that hood meant to represent, like, uh, niqab? Being um, Egyptian? I don't think the... I don't know if the hood is, but it looks like she is wearing, like, a hijab or something underneath it. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. You mm. don't normally yeah, you're not see supposed hair to show your hair. That's the whole point. Yeah. I, I don't Although know there if are that other is... Kinds of, there are other kinds of modesty coverings, but... 
Um, Look, yeah. I, I don't know if it's meant to be a hijab or not. <laughs> Let's leave aside yeah. one very, very big reason why you cannot put uh, culture, <laughs> yeah, ethnicity, <laughs> and um, body type on different axes and expect it to make sense for longer than 20 seconds. Yeah, right. So here we have the actual numbers, but we've also got a slightly different number of axes. So they've added socioeconomic background, which means class. They're using a euphemism for it, of course. They've also added beauty <laughs> and they've split ability into cognitive and physical ability. oh i hate that oh i, I hate fucking that so hate that fucking too much. and you notice that they haven't actually given her a ranking on the ability yet the drop down menu isn't filled in for this <laughs> oh cowards i know <laughs> also she's a sniper do you know the kind of maths you have to do to be a sniper <laughs> well like you have to accommodate the curvature of the earth well okay that because we have no information on what that classification is we can't we don't know what the norm is what the divergence from the norm is but in this universe there are canonically like super geniuses is that gonna be your norm yeah like iq was already terrible yes and then you decided to add i am a super brain genius yeah right so like, I am a genetically enhanced <laughs> gorilla. I will yeah. I keep coming back to that bloody creature. I love him. <laughs> He's <also> great. Why? <laughs> okay. We don't have any information on what this cognitive ability thing is, and it's a mm, bit, bit problematic. So let's have a look at these. And also what's valued in cognitive ability? Right. So Anna gets a point away from the norm on beauty because she is quote unquote slightly aged, which as mentioned is rude to the milf <laughs> hunters. She's also missing an eye. Uh, which is why she gets points in physical ability. Apparently missing an eye is worth four points. I mean, okay. Like, <laughs> that's that's its whole thing, as we've discussed. And I mean, if you were going to go, you could go with 6-6, six, six, which is the meters that you're meant to be able to see at, at six meters. You see something at six meters. It's the Australian equivalent of 20-20 vision. Right. that's 20 feet. But she might be have, like, perfect vision in her other eye. It's just... Like, this is the problem, right? You can't quantify it like this. Farah being seven is interesting to me. <laughs> I made a joke about my race being seven <laughs> earlier. Fuck. <laughs> yeah, right. So in culture and race, culture is listed as Egyptian because apparently culture corresponds one-to-one -one with nationality and race is listed as Arab. Oh, which... yeah, no, I'm a complete... I, I as an Australian, <laughs> share culture with literally every other one of the 26 million of us. Yes, exactly, right? Me and Tony Abbott went to <laughs> Oh, but he's imported. He's from Britain originally, so like he gets extra cooked units. This is a ho incredible homogenizing of these things. To say that there is an Arab race is like... <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Let's go with who. Yeah, on like one, right? an indigenous race. Yeah. I mean, and, like, I don't know. There, there were some like uh, left wing projects that embraced Arabic as like, uh, like Arab nationalism and things like that, which embraced. But then that's a nationalism and like that's its own kettle of eggs. But that's yeah. not ethnicity in the same way. It is ingrained in a shared sense of history and culture rather than a shared skin oh, tone. Oh, for sure. The idea of using skin tone as a stand-in for that as well is slightly Messed problematic. Up. Yeah, They've also, I will note, listed race here rather than ethnicity, which is an interesting shift between the internal software and the kind of external marketing material. Along this, we can also see that gender identity has woman, not female, and they and she gets five whole points for being a woman. So in yeah, in, in no, the in we, the once conference, again, well, is it because she's a milf? <laughs> is it the milf factor that makes her a woman? I don't know. I mean, she, she like it's not entirely. Because then clear. you're getting into gender gestational and genetic yeah. uh -huh, <laughs> nonsense. Uh -huh. In in the conference when they talked about um the like Zarya as fe uh, as female they referred to her as halfway along the gender <laughs> axis so apparently they think you can have twice as far a gender from male as female is she a demi girl <laughs> all right so let's go on uh, to this so this is from the second screenshot from the original blog post and it shows averages for each of these different 10 axes for a number of different groups. So here they have gender men, yeah, gender women. They don't have a gender other. They have morale, evil, morale, good, and morale, neutral. So um, <laughs> because... <laughs> I know, right? So what they have basically... like three wars! <laughs> I know. 
So with like, it- even if you're just going off military morale, there's been three or four different wars. All of the characters have been at different points of those, at yep. different stages of the war, and have had different opinions about their yeah. own heroics <laughs> or non. Yeah, their, their classification see here is slightly cooked. And at the very bottom, you have role. So damage, support, and tank, which is about gameplay itself, right? My gender is support. <laughs> <laughs> so what pisses me off a lot about this is that first, they assume that they can have valid numbers. Then they think they can extract valid summary statistics from those numbers. The nerve of these people. Uh, I, I'm going to specifically point out that men and women are the only two genders represented here, but also that we actually have the uh, facial features Ooh. and beauty <laughs> statistic. So we can see here that the uh, women have a more, like, a closer to zero, which means, I, I suspect, more beautiful than the men. So apparently in this universe, women are, on the whole, more beautiful than men. We've moved past eugenics, and now we're at phrenology. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? It needs must be remarked that the skull... <laughs> well, that would come under body type, perhaps. I mean, look, I'm saying that there's some relationship or ability, between these two. Or cognitive ability, if <laughs> yeah, we're getting right. real old school on the phrenology. <laughs> yeah. I think that this is before they had that gender... Or this chart may have been produced before they had the gender-neutral robot character. But, but I, they still had characters who were going to complicate that by virtue of being a robot and a gorilla. I know. It's like they're both men and that's fine, but they're going to have a different experience of manhood yep. than is no, Mr. No, no. Beefcake 76. Okay. No, no. We don't talk about the complexity of gender in this, right? It's just one axis. They get a score. I think a gorilla with a gun represents my uh, gendered experience quite well. Ideal um, gender. Well. <laughs> Uh, I'm also going to point to something that's quite interesting here, looking at the gender identity. So the mean of gender for the support role is higher than the mean for damage or tank, which in this context implies that there are more female support characters than there are tanks or damage. And that entirely lines up with their reductive understanding of everything involved in this. Yeah, so for a tool that is supposed like to identify- Like you can identify, be an evil healer, but you have to be a healer. This is kind of an interesting thing. So this tool is supposed to be able to identify things like stereotyping. I think we've identified some pretty strong stereotyping here. <laughs> and I want to talk about a, an example of this, which is the character Mercy. So this is Mercy. She's a uh, blonde, young-ish female. Uh, she's Swiss, I believe, is her culture, if you will, which I'm, I'm pretty sure that would count as Western, right? Uh, and she's also a literal angel in the sense that she flies, she heals people, she resurrects her teammates. I want to talk about Mercy because a tool which is supposed to detect, detect stereotyping should be able to detect the fact that this is a stereotype of a caring, healing, beautiful young woman in a support role. She they, is Florence Nightingale. Yeah, they called her Mercy, <laughs> for fuck's sake. This is something that if you have a tool which is supposed to quantify diversity and stereotyping, it should be able to get access to that. But I'm not convinced that this tool can. So in summary, this tool sucks and I hate it. This is not a good use of numbers. Numbers are not the right thing to use here. Stop using numbers to try and quantify stuff that shouldn't be quantified like this. I would genuinely be interested to create a template for a Dr. Barry, who was a trans dude in the same era as Florence Nightingale, and see what his stereotypy came up with compared <laughs> to Mercy. Yeah. Despite the fact that both would palpably be based on archetypes that exist. The first person to ever do a um, medical cesarean was a trans man, I believe. Yeah, that's that's Dr. Barry, yes. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. It's the same dude. Yeah. He's great. <laughs> he fucking hated Florence Nightingale. Hell yeah. And she fucking hated working with him. <laughs> she was like, I love his methods, but I hate him so fucking much. <laughs> and that would just be really interesting for party composition and healing. <laughs> oh, uh, we don't have interpersonal conflict within a team. I'm sorry. That would interfere with the gameplay. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> I, I should show my tits and get the fuck out, yes? <laughs> And you don't want to make your world richer, I find. Mm. No, we need to make this as narrow as possible so that everyone can have the gamer TM experience as rigidly as possible and do as little critical thinking about the fact that they are one, like, accident away from infirmity or disability, depending on what they happen to hit. 
So one of the biggest things that I think comes out of this, and one of the things that was said about this tool, is that it is really a, a way to cheap out on actually doing the hard work on producing more interesting, more diverse games. So Overwatch, gen the developers of Overwatch have really tried to have people from- The cake and eat it too. Well, no, they've tried to have a diverse selection of people writing characters. This has not necessarily carried over to functional diversity in the like gameplay experience, but that's because it's a video game, and video games, competitive video games, are expected to be fair in a way that the real world is not. Yeah, in the same way that transphobic arguments about sport, it's kind of like, I would like to know when it was decided that Gen like genetic or body advantages were not meant to be used in public sports. Yes. I could really have used that <laughs> around about the time they made me run the marathon and they would release the next cohort of students before I'd finished because I'm just slow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That was cruel. <laughs> that was needlessly <laughs> cruel. All right. I think that's a podcast. Artie, thank you so much for coming on. Lovely to speak to you again. Thank you for having me. Where can uh, people find you? Um, I have a Twitter. It is at Allied Wolves. I have a website that I don't use. And that's really... I have an archive of our own, I guess. Find me if you can. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. For the listener, uh, go look up Artie, but also have a look at our Patreon page. You get early access to episodes when I remember to do them early, as well as scripts, slides, and bonus episodes every month. But thank you again for coming and listening to me. Thank you for having me once again. And I'll talk to you later. Speak to you then.